Hi everybody, Jacob Reed here from ReviewEcon.com. Today we're going to be talking about the production function. We're looking at the relationship between inputs and outputs for a firm. If after watching this video you still need a little more help, head over to ReviewEcon.com and pick up the Total Review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. Let's get into the content. Now the production function shows us the relationship between different quantities of inputs and different quantities of outputs for a firm. So as we change the amount of physical capital, labor, or land, we will get different quantities of output. Now you can have both long run or short run production functions. In the short run, at least one input is going to be variable. And in the short run, you can hire more workers or fewer workers, and that will change the quantity of output a firm produces. In the long run, all inputs are going to be variable. A business can't change the amount of heavy machinery it has in the short run, but it can get that new physical capital in the long run. For the purposes of the AP microeconomics exam, we are going to focus on changes in the quantity of labor and how those changes in the quantity of labor impact firm's output. Here we have a production function. We have different quantities of labor that a firm could hire, and we are also looking at the total product, also called total physical product. This is the total quantity of output that can be produced with the given number of workers hired. If this firm hires one worker, it is going to produce 10 units of output. Hiring a second worker will give us a total of 25 units of output, and if we hire a third worker, we are going to get a total of 36 units of output. A fourth worker gives us 46 units of output, and a fifth worker gives us 50 units of output. But if this firm hires a sixth worker, we are going to reduce production, bringing us down to 48 units of output. Now this production function is for a fictitious firm, but it's helping us understand what a production function is. And if we go ahead and graph out the total product curve for this firm, we see different phases of production as more workers are hired. At low quantities of workers hired, each additional worker is going to increase the total product at an increasing rate. We call that increasing marginal returns, or increasing returns for short. Then we reach a phase where increasing the amount of workers hired will still increase the total product, but it will increase at a decreasing rate. We call that diminishing marginal returns, or diminishing returns for short. Finally, as we hire more workers, total product will begin to fall, and we call that phase negative returns. Now, as you should already know in regards to microeconomics, totals are important and they show up on your tests, but marginals are more important. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at marginal product. Marginal product is the change in the total product divided by the change in the quantity of labor. Now on this table, we have the change in the quantity of labor always being one. We're just looking at the impact of hiring one more worker. And that is most often the case on the AP microeconomics exam. So most of the time you won't have to divide by the change in the quantity of labor because the change in the quantity of labor will just be one. And so the formula for the change in the total product is the new total product as a result of hiring this additional worker minus the old total product. Hiring that first worker, the total product goes from zero units of output to 10 units of output. That's a marginal product of 10 units. Hiring the second worker increases our total product by 15 units of output. That's a marginal product of 15. The third worker has a marginal product of 11 units. The fourth worker has a marginal product of 10 units. That fifth worker, a marginal product of four units. And finally, the sixth worker has a negative two marginal product because there the total product actually decreases by two units from hiring that sixth worker. And now that we have a column for marginal product on our production function, we can now more easily see the three phases predicted by the law of diminishing marginal returns. When our marginal product is increasing, that's where our total product was increasing at an increasing rate. And we call that increasing returns. Then the marginal product begins to decrease, but is still positive. That means total product is increasing at a decreasing rate. Finally, we get to the point where we have the total product decreasing and there, marginal product is negative. And we call that negative returns. Now on your exam, you could see questions where they ask, on which worker does diminishing returns set in? The answer here would be diminishing returns sets in on the third worker because it's on that third worker that we first see a decrease in marginal product. You could also be asked after which worker does diminishing returns set in? If that's the question you are asked, the answer would be the second worker. So make sure you read these questions carefully to ensure you identify the correct number. When we put it on the graph at low quantities of workers, the marginal product will be upward sloping. There we have increasing returns because marginal product is rising. When marginal product is at its peak, 
diminishing marginal returns sets in and hiring more workers will cause our marginal product to fall. And when that marginal product crosses the x-axis, that's where we have negative marginal returns. Marginal product is negative and total product decreases. And so total product is at its maximum where marginal product is zero. So why is it that we get that upward sloping portion of the marginal product curve? Well, increasing marginal returns comes from specialization. That means tasks within a business are divided between workers and each worker gets very good at their individual task. Imagine we have a pizzeria with just one chef or cook. And in order to make a pizza, we have four different tasks. The dough must be made, the sauce must be cooked, the pizza must be assembled, and the pizza must be baked. If we have just one chef, that chef is going to have to bounce from station to station to make the pizza. The process of switching from task to task will not only slow down production, but it will be more difficult for the single worker to get good at any single task. And so if we increase the number of chefs within this kitchen, each individual chef will get better at their assigned task. If we have one making the dough, a second making the sauce, a third one assembling the pizzas, and a fourth worker baking the pizzas, each worker will get quite good at their individualized task, and that specialization will actually increase the marginal product for each of these additional workers hired. And the marginal product curve will increase as these workers are hired. But there will come a point when hiring more workers will actually diminish the marginal product. There we have more workers being spread around a fixed amount of physical capital. There's only so many machines and so much space within the kitchen. So in this phase, hiring more cooks will actually increase the number of pizzas that are produced but we will see an increase that is smaller than the previous workers. And then we reach the negative returns phase where now we have so many workers that workers are getting in each other's way and actively slowing each other down. Here, hiring more workers actually reduces production. There's just too many cooks in the kitchen to keep production up. Now you could see questions on your exam about marginal product versus average product. The average of anything is the total of that thing divided by the quantity. Here we're going to take the total product and divide it by the quantity of workers that are hired by the firm. We're going to add another column to our production function here to find our average product for each of these workers. We're going to take the total product and divide by the quantity of workers hired. So that first worker has a total product of 10 divided by one worker gives us an average product of 10. But if we hire four workers, we have a total product of 46. That's an average of 11.5 units of output per worker hired. And you'll notice that whenever the marginal product is greater than the average product, the average product will be rising. But when that marginal product is less than the average product, the average product will fall. And we will see that relationship when we graph it out as well. As long as that marginal product curve is above the average product curve, the average will be rising. And that's because the marginal is the value of the next piece. As long as the next piece is greater than the average, the average increases. And when the marginal product curve falls below the average product curve, the average product will begin to fall. And that's again because the marginal is the value of the next piece. And as long as the next piece is below the average, the average will fall. The highest point of the average product will be where it intersects the marginal product curve. The final thing we're going to talk about is the marginal cost of labor. The marginal cost of labor is the wage that workers are paid divided by the marginal product of those workers. So the money that workers are each paid divided by the marginal product of those workers will give us the marginal cost of the units those workers produced. So if we put back up our production function and add a marginal cost of labor column, we can calculate our marginal cost of labor. And if the wage for these workers is $60, we can take that $60 and divide by the marginal product, and that will give us the marginal cost of the output for each of these workers. Now we're not going to calculate the marginal cost of that sixth worker's output because a rational firm would not hire that worker since they have a negative marginal product. In order to graph the marginal cost curve, we're actually going to add back in our total product numbers there and graph those two columns on the price and quantity axes of our graph. So when we put it on the graph, the marginal cost of labor should look something like this. At low units of output, the marginal cost will begin to fall, and that is because of specialization. It's the same reason why we saw marginal product increase at low quantities of workers. Then at the minimum point of our marginal cost curve, we're going to see diminishing marginal returns set in. Producing more units of output, we'll see an increasing marginal cost, and that's because of diminishing marginal returns. 
Now on this graph, we're not going to see negative marginal returns because no rational firm would hire those workers and we can't get additional units of output produced. Later on in this unit, we will talk more about the average variable cost, but for now we're going to look at the average variable cost of labor. We're going to take the total number of workers times the wage they are paid and divide it by the total product of those workers. There are the numbers for our average variable cost of labor, and when we graph it out, we're going to see that the average variable cost of labor has a similar relationship to marginal cost as we saw with average product and marginal product. Now if we take a look at the marginal product and average product curves and compare them to the marginal product of labor and the average variable cost of labor curves, we will see that they are flipped upside down versions of each other. When the marginal product is rising, the marginal cost of labor will be falling. And when the marginal product of labor is falling, the marginal cost of labor will be rising. Likewise, if the average product is rising, the average variable cost of labor will be falling. And if the average product is falling, the average variable cost of labor will be rising. And there you have it. That is what you need to know about the production function. If after watching this video, you still need a little more help, head over to reviewecon.com and pick up the total review booklet. It has everything you need to know to ace your microeconomics or macroeconomics exam. That's it for now. I'll see y'all next time.